welcome everybody. It's really great to see such a large group of people look around. Almost every seat filled. And you know, recent events have caused a lot of anxiety. I'm talking about what's happening in Japan. And I think it's really important that we get together at times like this and support each other and get some good information happening. It's a privilege for all of us and an honor for me to introduce three courageous women activists from Russia who are on a national tour. This is one stop on their national tour to talk about the legacy of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster 25 years later. Uh, they're going to be speaking, but I just want to... Is everybody here? Yeah. Please stand up. Natasha Manzarova, Natalia Miranova, and Tatiana Muchamidarova. Yeah. We're also going to hear from Andrew Lichterman from the Western States um, Legal Foundation. There's Andrew in the back there. <laughs> Andrew's going to give us an update on what's happening at the Fukushima nuclear power plants right now and our vulnerabilities here in the United States and the nature of information at times like this. Uh, we will have ample time for questions and answers and students ask any question. No question is too simple. And you might ask a question and somebody else would be wondering the same thing. This is your opportunity because you're in the presence of these experts. We're going to be joined by nuclear engineer Ernest Goitein during a question and answer and he has a lot of technical information so um, take advantage of that as well. At the end of the program we're also going to hear from Kay Fisher from the Japan Pacific Resource Network about support for the people of Japan. My name is Phil Klasky and I teach in the Departments of American Indian Studies and Ethnic Studies. I have fought against the proliferation of nuclear weapons and nuclear power for the last 25 years of my life and the irresponsible disposal of <coughs> radioactive waste. So you know where I'm coming from. Full com confession about where I'm coming from. Nuclear power is an issue of environmental justice. And low-income communities of color, indigenous peoples around the world have suffered in every step of the nuclear cycle, from mining uranium to radioactive waste disposal of what Joanna Macy calls the poison fire that we find in the core of nuclear power plants. Anishinaabeg activist and scholar Winona LeDuc reminds us of the Iroquois or the Haudenosaunee philosophy that we must consider our actions for the next seven generations. Decisions we make today, we must think about the impact of those decisions in the next seven generations. But consider this. In the last 50 years, humankind has produced deadly substances that will have to be isolated from the biosphere for the next 250,000 years. And that's the next 12,000 generations. This is the legacy we are leaving behind. This experiment in nuclear power has gone commercial. And it's all over the world. And now we have to deal with the waste. American Indian tribes and communities have been considered the paths of least resistance and their lands have been targeted by federal and state governments, the departments of energy and interior, and the powerful and influential nuclear industry. Barack Obama received more money from the nuclear industry than his opponent, opponent John McCain. Consider that. The Department of Energy has pursued a policy of disposing of highly dangerous radioactive wastes on the Skull Valley Band of Goshute Indian Near Reservation in Utah and the Yakima Indian Reservation in Washington State, the Mescalero Apache Indian Reservation in New Mexico. Contamination from abandoned uranium mines are poisoning the Standing Rock, Pine Ridge, Cheyenne River Indian Reservations in the Black Hills of South Dakota and the Laguna Pueblo of New Mexico. The cancer rate for youth on the Navajo Indian Reservation is 17 times the national average from the dirty mess left behind
from uranium mining. The Western Shoshone are the most bombed nation on Earth. They, they live in Nevada, where the government has uh, developed, has exploded over a thousand nuclear weapons above and below ground. And the government has also pursued uh, building a high-level radioactive waste dump at Yucca Mountain. Now that project has been stopped for now, but you and I paid for a multi-billion dollar hole in experiment going down into the ground to find a geologically stable place for this high-level waste. And when they finally got down there, they found that indeed it was not stable. There were seismic cracks, there's leakages, and so uh, they abandoned the project. After one of their scientists, who was a whistleblower, came out and said, hello, your environmental impact statements, etc., they're wrong. This is not a stable environment. So what did they do? They fired him. They shot the messenger. And that Yucca Mountain and is called the Serpent Swimming West in the Shoshone language. The indigenous world uranium summits bring together Australian Aborigines, North and South Americans, native people, indigenous people from India, Africa, Pacific Islanders, and they have set principles and demands to stop the exploitation of, of native lands and people by uranium mining, nuclear power generation, nuclear testing, and radioactive waste dumping, and they also demand that their homelands be cleaned up and restored. <coughs> For over a decade, I worked with the Lower Colorado River Indian tribes and some of my friends who are in this uh, room today in a successful battle to stop a radioactive waste dump at a place called Ward Valley near Needles, California. The California state and federal governments conspired with the nuclear industry to bury long-lived radioactive waste in shallow, unlined trenches above an aquifer that communicates with the Colorado River, source of water for 23 million people and in critical habitat for an endangered species. What were they thinking? It was also the ancestral homelands for the Mojave, Chemwavy, the Kokopa, the Quetzan peoples. And the tribes and their allies stood firm against the nuclear industry, the state government, the federal government, and against one more attempt at what's called toxic colonialism. In my view, nuclear power is neither cheap, nor fair, nor transparent, nor safe, nor clean. Despite what the nuclear industry says, you have to find out for yourselves. This is just one talk. You're going to learn some things today, but you have to go home and you have to decide for yourselves. Use the critical thinking skills, the research skills that you're learning as students at this university to find out for yourself what's really going on because it's very, very important. Today's, speaker will, today's speakers will provide important information and critical perspectives on this issue. The issue is also very controversial. Soon as the accident happened at Fukushima, you heard people saying this is another Chernobyl, other people saying there's nothing to worry about, we're going to continue with nuclear power, we just have to make a few changes. So I encourage you to ask those important questions. Today's event is co-sponsored by the Department of American Indian Studies, Department of Anthropology, and the Environmental Studies Program, and Carlos Davidson is the, the director of that program and he's going to speak to you next. Please welcome Carlos. I have bad knees, so I'm going to sit down here. Thank you, Phil. Um, I want to thank Phil Klasky for doing a lot of the work to org um, the bulk of the work to organize this event, and thank our speakers for, for coming today. Um, I'm just going to say a few words. Uh, a lot of what we're and thank you all for coming out on a Friday afternoon. People said to us, Friday afternoon, you're not going to be able to get more than 20 people. So thank you for uh, proving them wrong. This is a great turnout. Um, I just want to say a few words about, um, we're going to hear a lot today about risk and safety issues, as we should, about nuclear power. 
But I want to just bring up two other issues. There are many issues involved in nuclear power. As you heard from Phil, there's a huge environmental justice issue involved, particularly in the mining of and disposal of the waste. Um, two other issues that I want to bring up um, that often don't get presented at all in the newspapers. Um, first, nuclear power is incredibly expensive. When nuclear power was first introduced in this country, the phrase, too cheap to meter, the idea was that we were, we wouldn't, it would be so cheap that we wouldn't even need to have electricity meters on our homes. Well, the opposite has turned out to be true, that nuclear power is more expensive than any of our other sources of power. Incredibly expensive. Um, and because of that, because it's so expensive, the federal government, in order to make nuclear power happen, has to provide billions and billions of dollars of subsidies. And those subsidies come in two areas. Um, one has to do um, with insurance. No private insurer is willing to insure full insurance for in case of a nuclear accident. Without that insurance, no business, no nuclear power developer could ever open up a plant. So in order to make nuclear power a possibility, the federal government has to deal with the insurance problem. So what they've done is limit, limit the liability of the plant owners and say, okay, we'll cap it at, uh, at a certain level. And beyond that, the federal government is basically on the hook, and that means you and me and all you know, our, our tax money it is liable in the case of a big accident. The second big area is the cost of building nuclear power plants just keeps going up and up and up. And recently, if you look at a graph, it's just gone up like this. And because of that, every time they build a plant, there are these huge billion dollar cost overruns. Private lenders will not lend for the building of a nuclear power plant. So if you just had, as you know, conservatives like to say a free market, there would be no nuclear power because they could not get the loans to build the plants. So again, the federal government has had to step in and provide billions of dollars of loan guarantees. That's the only way that the plant owners can get the, mo the money and get the loans because of the federal government providing the loan guarantees. So two huge subsidies from all of us, the public, to build nuclear power plants because they're so darn expensive and so risky. And, and that angle we, we tend not to hear about. Um, but secondly, I want to say, okay, so they're risky and they're expensive, but do we have any alternative? And, and I was shocked recently in, in my own environmental studies class I did a poll at the end of class and you know, kind of said, well, you know, given the accident and, and all of this, should we still be building plants? And a full third of the class said, yeah, I think, I think we still need to go ahead with it. And, and I was kind of shocked and, and I asked, and one of the, the reasons people said that, that they thought we needed to go ahead with it, because they didn't feel that we had good alternatives. And the shocking thing is that the alternatives are already being put in place. Um, a third, 35% of all new power generation in the United States since 2005 has been wind energy. Wind energy is already in place and in, since 2005 there's been more wind energy installed than gas and coal combined. Shocking. You, you still, you know, many people still have the sense of, okay, this is something for the future. When they work the bugs out, someday we'll be able to have clean energy. It's already happening. And if we took those massive subsidies that we put into nuclear, we could have a lot more of it. The California legislature just last week mandated that all our utilities, our public utilities, um, that a third of their electricity needs to come from renewables by 2020. That's not that far away, nine years, and we're supposed to have a third of all our, of our electricity from clean renewable energy. And that's a completely doable goal. That's not a hopeful, wishful, you know, maybe if something, 
that's a nuts and bolts, we can do this. Southern California Edison, one of the biggest utilities in the state, is a big supporter of the bill. They say, we can do this. We support the bill. So keep in mind, nuclear power is incredibly expensive, and we have cheaper, cleaner, safer alternatives already in place. So one of the many facets of, of nuclear power. Thank you for uh, coming out, and uh, we'll get to our main speakers.